Well, this morning we again are continuing in Luke's gospel. Uh, today, Lord willing, we're going to finish chapter 12. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 49 through 53, and as I read this, I think you'll see all the elements of what it is I've already been talking about that are plainly here, but I'm giving you the, um, oh, you know, the, well, just what do you call it, the summary of what we're going to be looking at of sort of a four glimpse of this so that uh, it'll be more understandable when we actually are into it. <clears throat> so this is what Jesus says. And I believe in this context, he is speaking to his disciples, but kind of like he was on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus went up on the Mount, he sat down, his disciples came to him, and the crowds were all around, and opening his mouth, he began to speak to them, to the disciples, but the crowds were also listening. And I think at this particular place, he is still addressing his disciples, letting them know, you know what's going to happen and uh, how things are going to go once that happens. But this evening, he's going to then turn to the crowds and talk to them a little bit more specifically about being able to tell what's going on. Uh, Messiah's here. And you need to make the right choice right now. You need to deal with your sins right now before you come before the judge, okay? So anyway, right now he's speaking to the disciples, and this is what he says. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to our understanding this morning. Now, remember in the context, Jesus has been teaching his disciples lessons based on what's been taking place around them. Remember, there's no better time to teach than when faced with a particular object lesson, right? Well, Jesus has had plenty of them. After Jesus and his disciples finished having lunch with the Pharisees, um, he warned them against their hypocrisy, that they should keep themselves from basically living something they're not, having a facade, acting like they wanted to please the Lord when really they wanted just to please themselves. We were reminded that God sees our hearts. He knows if we're fighting against our sins or just struggling to keep up appearances. To the Lord, we are an open book. So there's really no sense in trying to hide anything from him. Now, Jesus said further that they should not be afraid of these Pharisees because their hypocrisy would eventually be exposed. The mask would come off and they would be judged. But the Father will protect them. The Spirit would give them the words to say when they had to stand before them or others with greater authority. Um, the worst that their enemies could actually do to them would be to kill them and send them to heaven. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So Jesus says, go on confessing him, telling others what he has done. And we need to remember that, again, we have many enemies in the world. We're going to be reminded of that this morning. But the same promises apply to us. The Father will protect us. The Spirit will give us the words. And really, the worst thing that they could do to us is send us to heaven. Thankfully, we're not in a place where that's going to happen, at least in most cases, uh, just yet. Now, the second object lesson came from the man who asked Jesus to tell his brother to split the inheritance with him. This gave him the opportunity to warn his disciples against greed, that they must not use their lives to pursue money, wealth, and possessions, because not only would it stumble them here, since they would be tempted to trust in those things instead of trusting in God to meet their needs, it really is not going to help them in the place where they're going. Money is not going to help anyone when we stand before the Lord only how we used it in this world. Instead, they needed to trust God to provide for them. If they did, it would free them up to be able to use what the Lord has given them in this world to store up treasures in heaven where they would be able to keep them forever. And by the way, that is the kingdom Jesus said that, that his father has freely chosen to give them 
they knew it was theirs, and so they should bank on it, so to speak, and obviously, so should we. Finally, he told them to be ready for when he came for them. Remember, everything that Jesus is teaching his disciples, everything he teaches us, will actually do us no good at all unless we take what he's given us and put it into practice. Now, if they did this, Jesus said they would be ready for when he comes, whether it be 70 AD, whether it be the second coming, which wasn't going to be in their lifetime, and we know that because it still hasn't happened yet, whether it be that when the Lord comes for them at death, they would be ready, and if they did what the Lord called them to do, they would also have greater reward. The same will be true of us. But if they didn't get ready, uh, if they saw this as being a long ways off and they had time to waste and they can just kind of indulge themselves, they would be worse off in the long run. Jesus finished that section with a warning against those who don't obey him. To those who knew his will but didn't do it, remember that slave and all of mankind are really the creation of God and the servants of God. Those who knew his will but wouldn't do it, I think which included most of the Jews that were listening to Jesus at that moment, as well as Judas, one of the twelve, and many who are in the church today, and I'm not talking about just evangelical churches, there's all kinds of churches, but most of the people in churches today would fall into this category, right? Know what God desires, but don't do his will, but that's because they really don't know him. Jesus warned them and said they would have a greater punishment unless they repented and began to obey. And also he addressed those who didn't know his will and didn't do it. They didn't do it because they didn't know it, which is likely referring to those servants of his which are further off, the Gentiles, the ones yet to be reached. They would still be punished for their sins, but not as severely as the Jews who actually knew the will of God. They wouldn't be punished as severely because they didn't know as much. And remember, the reason why Jesus said this was not just to say, this is what's going to happen, but he was warning those who were around him. And he was also telling his disciples, there are those that are out there that still need to hear so that they might turn from their sins and begin to do what the Lord calls them to do. Now, remember, when Jesus said this, he was not trying to, uh, obviously, um, trying to destroy the principle of God's salvation by grace alone through faith alone. We know that that is true. But what he is saying is, if we have been saved by God's grace, which is received by faith alone, that it might be by grace alone, then it will change our lives. We will seek to know God's will, and we will do it to the best of our ability. And we will then be ready for when he comes for us. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And what that means is they listen to my voice. They give heed to my voice. Well, where's Jesus speaking? In the Word. And I know them. He's in a relationship with them. And they follow me. I mean, we need to follow Jesus, right? It's not that he's walking down the street and we fall in line behind him. But we follow the example Jesus gave us. We follow his word. We do what it is he said. That is the mark of a believer. Now, as Jesus was thinking about the fact that most of the Jews he was speaking to at this time were refusing to listen and that the Gentiles had yet to hear and how hard it would be for them then on the day of judgment, he then said three things in response to this because Jesus didn't take that lightly. Jesus came into the world to save people and so it was somewhat distressing. It was a concern to him. And so he says these three things. First of all, how he had come to fix the problem and his desire that that was already done. Secondly, what he had to do to bring this about and his desire too that that, that would be finished. And then once he was finished with his work, what the results would be. And that would be division, which is inevitable. Okay, but the division is actually a good thing, as we're going to see. Now, first of all, he tells us how he came to fix the problem of the many Jews that, were, you know, that knew his will but weren't doing it, the many who hadn't heard, and how much he desired that it was already done. He says in verse 49, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish 
it were already kindled. Now, we do need to ask the question, what does Jesus have in mind here, right? Because fire can represent a couple of different things. It can refer to judgment or it can refer to the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't think that he is referring to judgment here, which is what fire often represents in the Bible. You know how many times when the Lord brings judgment, fire is involved? God rained fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness, because of their sins. When God was delivering his people from Egypt because the Egyptians wouldn't let his people go, one of the judgments he sent was hail mixed with fire. When Aaron's two sons were ministering before the Lord and they thought they would be innovative and offer some incense that God had not commanded them to, to offer, fire came out of the altar and burned them up right then. When Korah, one of the, not, I, you know, not this son of Korah that wrote this psalm, but, but their father Korah, and Dathan and Abiram and On and those with them decided that they could be priests as well as Aaron's son, and Moses had them stand before the tent of meeting. The Lord basically told them what he thought about their innovation, and fire came out of the tent of meeting and burned them all up. The Lord says that he is going to burn this world up one day in his fiery judgment when he throws the wicked into a lake that burns with fire. Fire is a symbol of judgment. Fire is what the Lord uses for judgment. As a matter of fact, it is a fire that is going to be tormenting those who have not turned from their sins to Christ for eternity. Now, I don't think fi that kind of fire makes sense here, because, um, especially because of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Why did Jesus come into the world? To destroy the world? To judge the world? No, that's not why he came. He came to save the world. I think here he's, he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. This was not the time of his wrath. That was the time of his mercy. Today is still the day of the Lord's mercy where he is offering salvation to all who will come to him. What he is talking about here is sending the Holy Spirit. Remember what John the Baptist said of Jesus in Matthew 3.11 that we read at the very beginning. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, fire is also a symbol of purification, isn't it? The Spirit applies Jesus' work to us, and he sanctifies us. Fire is a symbol of zeal. The Spirit gives a fiery affection and zeal for the Lord and for his kingdom. This is really what was lacking in, in what was taking place at Jesus' day as he's looking at the crowds around him and even his own disciples. This is what Jesus actually came to bring, and this is what he wished was already kindled. Now, we do understand the Spirit was already there. You know, nobody can be saved apart from the Spirit's work, but he was working in very few people. I mean, even after all was said and done, Jesus' ministry was finished at the end of three and a half years. There were, what, 120 or so that gathered together for prayer. The group was still very small. I mean, by human standards, we might say that Jesus' work didn't seem to be much of a success as far as his preaching ministry. And yet we know it was ultimately a success because he was laying the groundwork for this very thing that was about to take place. So there were very few that were actually saved. And the zeal that um, they had wasn't as great as it would be after Jesus sent this fire. Jesus wanted this fire to come and to save many and to inflame the hearts of his people. But secondly, before Jesus could send the Holy Spirit, there was something that he needed first to do, something he very strongly desired to have done. He says in verse 50, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Now here he's talking about the baptism of his sufferings, which he was going to go through on the cross. He needed to die on the cross. Remember when God first made man and woman, he made them in his image, he endowed them with his Holy Spirit, basically he put his love in their hearts so that they would want to do what he loved, what he knew was right, what he knew was good. But when Adam 
chose against God, when he disobeyed God and he fell, he lost the Holy Spirit. Eve lost the Holy Spirit. But Adam lost the Spirit not just for himself, but for all of his children, which includes all of us. Jesus came to bring the Holy Spirit back. And to do this, we know he had to do a couple of things. He had, first of all, had to become one with us. It's what the virgin birth is all about, right? Jesus became uh, one who is eternally God, the Son of God, became man. He united himself to our nature because we sinned. We had to make the payment. He had to obey his Father perfectly from the very beginning to the very end. That's why he didn't just sort of come out as an adult or get dropped as an adult into this world. He had to live from childhood all the way to adulthood. And, of course, Jesus had to take care of our guilt. He had to die on the cross. The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, the sins of everyone who would ever believe in him were credited or imputed to him, and he suffered and died in our place. He had to remove that guilt. He had to make a payment to satisfy God's justice because God is just. He just can't overlook sin any more than we can. If somebody comes and takes away something that we have, that needs to be rectified, okay? We, we know that if somebody injures us, if somebody kills us, it has to be dealt with. That's what justice should be about. That's what God's justice is about. But God actually dealt with it through Jesus if we trust Jesus. And if we don't trust Jesus, he's going to deal that justice to us. So since that was the only way that Jesus could bring the fire that he wanted to cast into the world, he looked forward to the crucifixion. See, there is a sense in which Jesus wanted to die on the cross. Now, he didn't look forward to the sufferings. We know that. Because before he went to the cross, he was actually praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But he was looking forward to the results. And the result would be after he was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, he would have the authority to send the Holy Spirit to cast this fire upon the earth. And that's what he did on the day of Pentecost. We already sang about that in one of our hymns. Now, finally, Jesus tells us that this fire would have a dividing effect. He says in verses 51 through 53, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Sometimes we get the impression, um, particularly in, in you know, Reformed churches, that um, everyone in the household is, is somehow going to be saved. And that isn't always the case. Jesus tells us that isn't the case here. It can actually divide households, right? Now, Listen to what Jesus says here. It almost seems to contradict something that Luke wrote earlier. And so we should take a moment to understand it. Remember when Jesus was born. Remember what the angelic choir came out to sing. And how, you know, the angels, uh, excuse me, the, the, uh, the shepherds heard this message. Luke 2.14. This is what they said. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, during Christmas time, we often sing carols that talk about peace on earth and how Jesus came to bring peace on earth. But listen to what Jesus just said. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. Okay, so we have to make sense out of those two things. What does it mean? What do the angels mean? And what does Jesus mean? Well, we know that the angels meant that he came to bring peace between God and man. Okay, not necessarily between man and man, unless they come to God. The Bible tells us that the human race is at war with God. We might not think that we are, but that's exactly what we are. We're at war with Him, and in a certain sense, He's at war with us. But the war ends for everyone who believes in Jesus, and bring, that brings peace with God. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith trusting in the Lord Jesus, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, 
didn't we have peace before? I feel like I was at war with God. Yes, I was at war with God because I did not want to do what God wanted me to do. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I might have thought God thought that was okay, but he didn't think that was okay. As a matter of fact, God tells us through the Apostle Paul that he is showing the world every day that what we do uh, that's against his will is not okay to him. The wrath of God is being revealed every day against the unrighteousness and wickedness of men. We're at war, but when we trust in the Lord Jesus, the warfare ends and we have peace because we lay our weapons down and the Lord receives us as his sons and daughters. Now, we also know from the Bible that that peace will eventually be worldwide when he brings the new heavens and the new earth. Everyone there will love him and he will love everyone. There will be no warfare there at all. What Jesus is telling us here is that in the meantime, there will not be peace in this world, at least not between the two kingdoms that exist in this world. The fire that he sent, or that he is about to send, or he desires would be sent, is going to intensify, actually, the warfare. It's going to stir up hatred. You know, as long as everybody's going the same direction, there's no, no warfare. But when they start going different directions, that's when the warfare begins. And there's still going to be these two groups of people. There's going to be those who believe, those who don't believe, those who love the Lord, those who don't love the Lord. The warfare that was going on right then between Jesus and the Jews, they may not have thought that they were at war with God either, but they're also the ones that called out for Christ's crucifixion. That's how much they actually hated him, even though it doesn't appear that that's what they were doing. But there was warfare going on between Jesus and the Jews. That warfare was going to get stronger after this fire was sent because now there were going to be many more in his camp than there was before. This warfare was going to intensify to the point where it would even divide families because some within these households were going to trust in Jesus and some of them were not. So Jesus says he did not come to bring peace, but he came to bring division in the world. But we do need to understand that division is inevitable. If you have two people going two different directions with two different sets of ideas of what is right and wrong, there's going to be division. There's going to be conflict. Okay, so that's what Jesus means. Now let's move on to a little bit of application. Now we know that Jesus has already done what's necessary to bring the Holy Spirit into the world, to send this fire. He died on the cross, he rose again, he ascended into heaven to be crowned king. And we know that he has already sent this fire, he's already cast the fire upon the earth. He sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to empower his people, and it did make, or he made, a great difference, not only in the number of people who were being saved, because remember at the end of Jesus' ministry, 120 people. Okay, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 are converted. Big difference, okay? And then we see a big difference in Peter, don't we? Going from hiding because he's afraid the Jews are going to kill him when he thought Jesus was gone, uh, to being empowered to preach before all of these people and even to speak before the Sanhedrin, the, the elders of Israel and so forth, even though he knew he might very well die for doing it, makes a big difference. And since that day that he brought this fire, that warfare and that division has been growing, okay? There are more people trusting Jesus than there were then and who are following Jesus, and that's putting them at odds with those in the world. I mean, just look at what's going on around you. Paul told us earlier in 2 Corinthians, again, that there are two kingdoms in this world, and these two kingdoms obviously don't mix. They don't mix together, which is why he tells us to be careful about our associations in verses 14 and 15. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or, and this one in particular, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What do you think the answer to that question is supposed to be? Nothing. Okay. Now, we do have different things that we are, that have in common with them on another level, but at a certain level, with regard to our relationship with the Lord and the love of things that are right, we have nothing in common with them. I mean, as children of God, we are as different from unbelievers as night and day. 
which again, why he gives us this caution, because we love what God loves. The world loves what, what the world loves. They love the world, the things that John tells us we shouldn't love in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride, the boastful pride of life, all that is in the world. If we love that, John says, the love of the Father is not in us. Well, the world, that's what they love, but we love the things of God. We want to, you know, live as God calls us to live in His Word, but they want to do what pleases them, you know. Again, the world's philosophy, you only go around once in life, grab for all the gusto you can. Uh, the Lord basically tells us that there's really no way that we can get along with unbelievers because we have to agree, right? We have to agree, at least to have that close relationship. How can two walk together unless they agree? Well, Paul just told us they're not going to agree because they don't, you know, they have nothing in common. There's so much that we don't agree on. I mean, there's so many issues today that I could pick. Let me just mention a few. We believe that unborn children should be protected. The world believes they're disposable. If they're not convenient, you can kill them. We believe in justice. You know, we believe in capital punishment. That's what the Bible teaches. If you destroy the image of God, take away a man's life, your life is, is forfeit. Today, and actually John Gerstner, who was uh, R.C. Sproul's mentor, said this back, I think, in the 80s, if not earlier, that our justice system is completely broken down. Today, to punish somebody for a crime is the crime, not the crime itself. And I think we see that happening more and more. Now, here's a more touchy issue. We believe that God created male and female. The world believes that, that that's really an arbitrary term and that we shouldn't designate anyone a male or a female until they decide what they want to be. But God made us biologically male and female. We believe that marriage should be between one man and one woman because that's what God says it should be and they believe it can be between two men and, or two women, which God says is sin. It's wrong. We believe in sexual purity and they believe that anything goes, you know, sexual liberty, uh, the, the free love movement and so forth. It's just gotten worse from that time. We believe that a man and a woman should live together unless they're married. They believe it's okay to live together. Now, we know there's a lot of disagreements, and we've seen how it's working itself out in this world. The fact that we don't agree and that we take a stand for the truth, that's what's making the world hate the church. The division then becomes evident. It doesn't if you're not doing anything. If you're walking down the street and you run into somebody and you greet them and you may be a believer and they're an unbeliever, it's not going to necessarily create any strife there. But once you begin to talk about what you're all about, then it will. So it, it creates a division between the world and the church. And that, by the way, that wasn't uh, the Spirit of God opening the door to let us all out. Uh, I opened that door so we could bring somebody in there this morning, but apparently that's okay. Anyway, but even if the world sometimes seems to appear to choose the right things, we need to understand it's still different, okay? to um, care for the needy, to feed the poor, to offer medical help to the sick. There's a lot of unbelievers that, that are doing a lot of good things, things that we would agree with that should be done. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is they're doing it for a different reason than what we would do it for, okay? We would do these things because that's what God tells us to do, and He tells us to do it because it's right. We would do it because we want to honor the Lord because we want to love Him, and because we love these who are in, in need. Now, the world would do it because certainly they care about others and they want to help them. Certainly they do. But they don't ever do it because they love God. They don't do it because they want to obey what He says in His Word, and they don't do it because they want to honor Him and give Him glory. They don't because in their hearts they're still at war with Him. The fire that the Lord gives divides the church from the world. It can even divide households. Now, again, Jesus gave us several different examples of this. And let me just ask you this question. Has there ever been a division in your household because of something the Lord says? Okay, it's simply reflecting what Jesus said would be the case. You want to do His will. They don't want to do His will. That's going to create strife in the household. Now, the gospel is the reason 
It's the cause, the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. That's what causes the warfare. Jesus says you need to be aware of it, but let's not forget this. The gospel and the fire that Jesus sent is also the solution to the problem. Jesus didn't send the fire into the world to create a problem. I mean, really, the, the, the problem is on the other side. As he's bringing people into his kingdom, the division is becoming more evident, but the division is still there. It's just making it evident. But he is energizing these people, energizing us with his Holy Spirit so that we will be the solution to the problem. I mean, how do we make peace in our homes? How do we bring peace in this world? Well, there's only two ways, right? You can either compromise and then do what they want you to do and just agree with them. That'll end the strife, but obviously we can't do that because that would be to betray the Lord. The other option is through the gospel and through prayer that their hearts might be changed because we're only going to have peace when we all agree on what's right and what's wrong. And to do that, we all need to trust the same Savior. And we all need to submit to the same word. And that is the reason, by the way, there's, there's going to be peace in the new heavens and the new earth because that's what's going to happen. We're all going to agree at that time. But until that time, the Lord wants us to use the fire that he's given to us to make this world as much like that, that new heavens and that new earth, as we possibly can while we're here. The Lord gave us his spirit to save us, but he also gave us the spirit to make a difference. And so the Lord calls us to let that fire burn brightly, let that light shine in order that others may see and may come to the Savior. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to help us receive and apply what he's told us this morning.